Paul. Why do you think readers are still so engaged with the Greek myths? Um, how did you come to them first? So I came to Greek mythology, um, I mean, it really, I can't even remember when it was so long ago. Um, I've just always really loved Greek mythology. Um, my parents used to take me on holiday to Cyprus where they had family friends, and so I was very fortunate to visit the ancient ruins of Curion, and it's one of my earliest memories. Um, and there's a photograph of me as a toddler there on my Instagram, if anyone's seen it. Um, just, which I just think kind of pinpoints the, the time when I just became immersed in this other world. And at first, when I was younger, I was just kind of fascinated by the fact, well, you can be in the physical place where ancient people of the past were, and you can have that kind of physical connection. But on hearing the stories um, and learning about the mythology, I felt there is a deeper connection, there is an emotional connection. And I came to see that it's really the connection that, that links us through the centuries um, to these people who are so different from us in so many ways and so very much the same. And I think myth mythology just connects you to this emotional truth at the heart of humanity. They're stories, like you said, of gods and monsters um, and magic, but they are really stories of who we are. Um, so be careful where you take your kids on holiday. And this is one, <laughs> one message to take away. Um, um, am I right in thinking you actually have to take some quite dramatic action to study them further at A level? Um, well, I, um, I went to one sixth form that didn't offer classics um, and I realised quite swiftly that was a terrible mistake. Um, and so, so I, I dropped out actually um, at 16 and I worked for half a year and then I re-enrolled at a sixth form college in Leeds, which is where I'm from, um, and studied classical civilization A-level and just never looked back. <laughs> Um, but um, there, there was, uh, you, you taught English for a while, I think, as well. That's right. Yeah. What, what, what do you think that, that teaching English taught you about being a writer? I mean, I think a huge amount. I think I came out of university with a degree in classics that I didn't know what on earth I was going to do with. I'd studied it because I'd loved it, but I didn't have a clear plan in mind. And um, I became an English teacher because I thought, well, I love books and I want to share that love, um, which is a very idealistic approach to getting into teaching um, and 13 years later I realised maybe that wasn't all there is to it um, and so I, I started to write my own novels um, and I think that being an English teacher probably, I mean it certainly gave me a good approach to discipline and organisation without which I would definitely struggle um, and it was, it was always such a joy I think um, to when, when you had that moment that clicked with students in the classroom when you were reading, it was always my favourite thing to do was to, was to read a novel with them. And I found that students all the way up to kind of 16-year-old rugby playing boys would love to be read to. And I think you, you create relationships through stories. And that, that's true all the time. And I think as an author, we create relationships with our readers in very much the same way. And that's something that's remained this really steady constant. Yes, I, I heard that today some, uh, someone saying that authors were composers and readers were musicians in their answer. I get any more that in your thoughts? Yeah, that's a, really, that's a very apt analogy. Yeah. So, um, in your, your first novel, um, Ariadne explores the story of Theseus and the, and the Minotaur, and your second, Electra, is, is looking at um, the story of three women who have these battles of their own to fight while the Trojan War is going on around them. Um, can you um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Atalanta, the, the first, the only female organoid? Yes. Yeah. as much as I know about <laughs> Um, so, yeah, well, I was drawn to her story for that very reason, that everybody has heard of Jason and the Argonauts. Everyone, even people who know very little about Greek mythology, are familiar with that story. But when I said I was writing about Atalanta, most people said, well, who is, who's that? And they just didn't know her name. And going back to my source text, going back to the Argonautica, which is in um, our only sort of complete ancient text that tells the story of the Argonauts' voyage, and there's a moment where she asks to join and Jason says no. And I felt that that really indicated there must have been some dialogue about this in, um, in ancient Greece about whether she was an Argonaut or not. She obviously is in some versions, 
But in this kind of definitive version, as in as much as we can have one, um, she wants to join, she's refused, and Jason takes her spear on board instead, which really annoyed me, um, <laughs> because she needs that. Um, so I took a lot of satisfaction in thinking, well, I'm going to rewrite this story, I'm going to rewrite The Voyage of the Argonauts, and I'm going to put her right in the centre, um, I'm going to write her back into the story that she's been written out of. Well, I'm very glad you did. Um, that, that seems like a, a good moment for a, a, a reading for a I would absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to I'm going to read the prologue of the novel, which um, it was the the part of her story that really drew me to her the most is her very unusual origin story. So that's what I'm going to share. When I was born, they left me on a hillside. The king had given his decree: if it's a girl, expose her on the mountain. And so some unfortunate soul was dispatched from the palace with this unwanted scrap of humanity, a baby girl, instead of the glorious heir the king desired. Left on the bare earth, I suppose I might have howled for as long as my little lungs could bear it. Or I could have lain whimpering and fearful, watching as she came closer. The mother bear, her cubs still blind and damp furred, attracted by the plaintive sound of a desolate newborn, her maternal anxiety still at its peak. I'd like to think I looked up at her, the mother bear, and held her gaze, that I didn't flinch away from her hot breath or the rough caress of her paw. She must have been too solicitous to leave me, unable to stand the sound of a hungry infant, and so she scooped me up and took me back with her. I grew strong on bear milk. I learned to wrestle with my bare siblings, the rough and tumble of our play with no quarter given. I never cried when their claws or teeth scraped my skin, or when they growled and pounced. Rather, I twisted my fingers into their fur, pulled them to the ground, buried my own teeth in their flanks, and bit as hard as I could. By night, we curled up together, a tangle of limbs, ursine and human, the soft pads of their paws resting on my sun-browned flesh, in our warm nest of leaves and earth, the damp rasp of their tongues against my face. Seasons passed, and weaned from their mother's milk, they learned to hunt for themselves, tentative at first, perched precariously on slippery rocks in the fast-flowing river that rushed through our forest. I would sit cross-legged on the grassy bank, watching the water for the shining dart of fish, sc fish scales like they did, laughing at their clumsy swipes, the splashes that left them bedraggled. At first, their mother stayed close, intent upon them, but as their confidence swelled, she started to wander further away. She sniffed the air, her eyes drawn to the sloping hills, her attention drifting from us, caught by something else. The cubs knew it before I did. They made themselves scarce before he appeared, the huge male in search of a mate. They hid themselves in the trees when he came shambling out of the mountains, from some faraway cave where the scent of the mother bear had carried on the fresh spring breeze. An irresistible summons to this monster, who seemed to rear up to the height of the trees themselves. The rumbling in his throat sounded like the thunder that had shaken the branches while I'd lain safe among the sleeping cubs all winter. She sensed it too. In the space of a moment, the time it took for the wind to turn, she changed, swift, abrupt, and inevitable. Her loving caresses turned to snarls and swipes. If any of her young looked back longingly before they scattered to the safety of their high branches, she leapt to chase them away. I trembled from behind a boulder, feeling the hot blast of air as she roared her warning. The only mother I had known in my short life was gone, replaced with something terrible. She let him follow her. From where I hid, I saw his great head butting against her neck and her answering nuzzle. The cubs were agitated at first, but after a while they calmed and one by one, each of them at last climbed down. I watched as my brothers and sisters made their own separate ways through the forest quickly swallowed up by the towering trunks and verdant branches. Disorientated, I went too, wandering without direction among the trees. But in time, my tears dried up 
and my gasping breath slowed. I knew where I was, and the familiarity of the forest was soothing as I walked. The air was golden green, filtering through the leaves, rich with the scent of pine and cypress and soft black earth. A fat spider squatted in the centre of her web between two branches, her hairy brown body and striped legs almost disappearing against the bark. A snake darted forwards, coiling swiftly into a protective circle, the diamond sheen of its scales glittering where the sunlight fell across it. Where the trees thinned out on the higher slopes of the mountain, lions prowled, sleek and soundless through the ragged bushes and rocky outcrops. A forest sharp with fangs and claws, trickling with venom, pulsing with life and beauty. There are a thousand interconnected threads crisscrossing through it, from the ancient roots soaking up water deep beneath the earth so that the trees could lift their mighty crowns towards the sun, to the insects that burrowed in the deep crevices of the bark, to the birds that nested in the boughs, to the deer that trotted lightly, and the stalking predators ready to pounce. And in the heart of it all, there was me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad you, you chose to read the prologue. I think it's, it's a lovely piece. And one of the things I love about it is how it shows how, how Atalanta is, is so sort of at one with the, the forest. She's coming from a very different place from your, your previous female protagonist. Yeah, it was one of the things that drew me to her because it was the chance for the first time to write about this very unique woman who grows up never knowing that as a woman she might be treated any differently. She, she's never told that she's anything less. And so you get somebody who is really unlike anybody else that I've ever written about before. Um, um, perhaps it would be um, good just to say a couple of words about the, the, the quest for the Golden Fleece that she she ends up getting involved in. So, as, as, this very, um, as, this, as this heroine who grows up in this very unique situation, and she, she doesn't, I, had to, I, I knew that I had to bring her out of the care of the bears because I didn't want her to end up um, completely wild and unable to talk. I had to do some research into um, kind of how, how children actually who have been abandoned in the wild, how they have grown up, where the w windows for opportunity are. Um, and so I decided that as a young girl she would be adopted by the goddess Artemis and that she would grow up in the company of Artemis's handmaidens, her nymphs. Um, because in mythology we know that Atalanta is adopted by hunters, and I think the assumption is quite often that they would be male hunters. But we know that Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, ruled these forests, and so it made a lot more sense to me that she would grow up in a female community. Um, and then as the protégé then, as Artemis, as kind of Artemis's um, mortal counterpoint, Atalanta has to do something. She has to prove her worth. She has to find glory in the way that the male heroes of Greek mythology find glory, which is that they are sent, usually by a god, on a quest. And this quest in particular is that um, Jason's quest for the Golden Fleece, which, although it's led by Jason, the Argonauts are led by Jason, he seems very peculiarly ill at ease as a leader um, and very kind of unused to fitting into the hero mould. Um, and the Argonauts all together, they're kind of like the Avengers of Greek mythology. You get all the big names, you get Heracles is there, Orpheus is there, and um, the father of Achilles, Peleus, is on board. And so Atalanta has to take her place in this very male-dominated society for the first time in her life, and she has to prove herself against the rest of them. Yeah, it's... it's um... Uh, wonderful looking back at your your earlier books. Um, uh, how, how did you how did it feel different writing it? A woman who was born without this knowledge of these constrictions, as opposed to the the ones like Ariadne who had grown up sort of very much surrounded by. So it made I I felt a real kind of advantage of writing Greek mythology is that within this genre that you can almost write very different subgenres of book because Greek mythology is so varied and so intricate. And, and when, it, when I was writing Ariadne, it was very much in the wake of the Me Too movement and it was very much with this feeling of 
of sadness, a kind of grief for the fact that women like Ariadne had played such a vital role in a hero's journey, in Theseus's journey. And then she'd been swept aside and she'd been blamed um, for his behaviour and she was the one who paid the price. When I came to write Electra, that grief had given way to a kind of anger and I wanted to write about women who were going to get revenge, who were going to take control of the situation. And that leads them into some very bloody and violent scenarios. Um, but with Atalanta, I felt that there is something so triumphant about her story and there is something so joyful and I wanted to celebrate something about being female, about being a woman, about being someone who can live up to her full potential. And so it felt like a very, it felt kind of gloriously escapist to write Atalanta. Um, because in the, in the, the process of the, the, the journey of, of Argos and, and Jason, um, she encounters another one of the great tragedies of, of Greek mythology is, is Medea, who um, was uh, ends up abandoned by Jason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's fascinating looking at the relationship between those those two women. Well, I loved writing the Argonauts because they're kind of the generation before. Um, some of the big myths that we know so well, or we get to see um, kind of what happens to these characters before they become the characters who are defined by um, the, the Athenian tragedies. And with Medea, everyone knows her from the Euripides play Medea, and I think it forms our opinion of Jason as well, um, where Jason in that play is this terrible, obnoxious, gaslighting man um, who really deserves everything that's coming to him, has massively underestimated the woman that he's married, and as the audience, you watch this terrible tragedy unfold, and you watch Medea do something that seems inexplicable, unforgivable, um, you know, the most terrible crime, but you are with her all the way through that play. And that's not the Medea and Jason that I was writing. I kind of had to go back and work out who they might have been before they became those people and to watch the kind of ill-fated romance start to play out. But I found with writing Medea into the story, the most difficult thing was to stop her from taking over. <laughs> and because she's such a dominating character, she's such a force to be reckoned with. Um, and when she enters the story of the, the Argonauts, she takes over that as well. Um, she, she engineers the um, retrieval of the Golden Fleece, which belongs to her father. They've come to steal it from her. Um, and she decides for her own reasons, for her own advantages, that she's going to assist Jason with it. So a bit like Theseus, Jason doesn't really do any of the work involved in his heroic exploits. Um, it's all down to a much more talented woman. Um, but somebody that he really shouldn't have got on the wrong side of. Um, but... Having at seeing Medea through Atalanta's eyes, I was very conscious of the fact that just because you have two strong female characters, and I use that phrase kind of with caution because strong female characters become shorthand for quite often a kind of very blunted caricature, um, which is not what I wanted to write at all. But they are clearly two very powerful women. I didn't want to think that just because they're women they would be drawn to one another, that they would have a sense of sisterhood, that they would go off and make friendship bracelets together and everything would be fine. Um, I didn't want to fall into either kind of trap of, because they're women, they, they must be friends or they must be nice to each other. There's nothing very nice about either of these women, to be honest. Um, but also that they wouldn't necessarily pit themselves against one another. I don't like it when women are made to be rivals either. So I felt that Atalanta would see, view Medea with a definitely a respect for her strength and her power, but that there would be something more complicated and nuanced about their relationship as well. Yes, I get, I get the impression that it's almost, it's, that Atalanta has these sort of mixed feelings about Medea and also the way that she attracts the attention that she attracts or the source of the attention she attracts. So it's, a, I think, a wonderfully subtle portrait of, of those sort of triangular relationships within the group. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, um, I think as well with Medea, her, um, a lot of her power comes from the fact that she, she is a witch, essentially. She is a sorceress. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Atalanta, Atalanta's strength is very different. She is, she is like a child of nature. She's an incredibly skilled athlete. And so there is a kind of a certain level of distrust, I think, that she feels.
Um, so, going back to your first book, could you tell us a little bit about that sort of tradition, that, that transition from you know, being a, a, a huge fan and, and, and student of these myths uh, to you know having a, a, a best-selling novel out in the marketplace? Um, well, so uh, it, was, it was a really strange thing that I'd, I'd always known I loved Greek mythology. I'd always known I wanted to be a writer, and I, it took me like 35 years to put those two things together and think, actually, <laughs> um, they do go together quite well. So I'd spent my 20s starting to write other kinds of books and miserably failing because I couldn't find my voice, I couldn't find the kind of thing um, that I could ever see through to completion. And when it came to writing Ariadne, I always credit my eldest son, actually, with the inspiration for it, because I was reading the story of Theseus and the Minotaur, and of course that's what it was called, Theseus and the Minotaur. Um, but it was my son Ted who asked me halfway through, oh, what happens to Ariadne? And she disappears out of the story. She, she gives Theseus the thread to lead him out of the labyrinth, and then I think this version, because it was for children, slightly fudged the bit where he takes her to Naxos and abandons her to die. Um, but I knew that was what had happened to her. She just kind of disappeared off the pages in this one. And I thought, yeah, she has got a great story. And actually, I knew there was more to her. And I knew that she was the half-sister of the Minotaur. And so I thought, well, I wonder why she did decide um, that she was going to betray a member of her family, her whole family for a man like Theseus. I wonder what led to that decision. I wonder what it was like to grow up with a Minotaur as a brother. Um, and I wonder what went on, what happened to her afterwards, because Theseus is not the beginning or the ending of her story. And that was something that initially I wanted to read. And when I couldn't find it, I decided perhaps I'll be the person to write it then. Um, and so when you, you sort of made that decision, um, uh, where did it begin? Did it begin with, with going into actual research or imaginative research? Or? Well, it was actually a New Year's resolution and the only one that I've ever kept. I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person who usually manages. Um, so it was the 1st of January that I opened a big research text. I got out my books from university. Um, and I did a day of research before I started writing. That's not all the research I did. Um, but because I was so passionate and so enthusiastic about writing this novel, I didn't, want it to, I didn't want to have a reason to procrastinate. I didn't want to be putting it off and putting it off. And so I kind of um, intertwined the two together. And because with mythology, one story opens up another story and you find yourself lost very appropriately in a labyrinth of, of myths. Um, it did involve a certain level of kind of pruning back and, and working out which stories I wanted to tell. But it made me see how Ariadne's story had parallels with so many other women of Greek mythology, and in particular Medusa, um, who is another woman who, like Ariadne, becomes villainized and very literally monstered for somebody else's behavior, in her case, Poseidon's behavior. And so I was very interested in how their stories intersected and the way that we, that we view these women. So was there any sort of points in your planning where you were um, thinking about how, you know, which stories you'd read together? Or was it a case of sort of lifting them up against the main narrative and seeing what fitted? I think in my first version, I, I put everything in. <laughs> um, and the editing involved a lot of taking out um, very many of them. Yeah, that, that's, I think that's always the best approach to it. Yeah, I think it's true of all historical fiction. You, kind of, you, you do so much research and you, you, you want to put everything in and then you realise that actually that's not always what people want to read. And I, mean, I think in all of your writing there's such a sort of vivid sense of, of place and texture of materials and that sort of thing. How, how did you sort of approach that, that side of research and the sort of material culture of this very distant period? That was trickier. That was the trickier part because when it comes to the actual stories, um, I had such a wealth of resources to draw on. So many literary texts, so many retellings, so many reinterpretations, so many artistic interpretations as well, statues and paintings and vases um, to look at um, to create the stories and the characters. But actually to build a believable Bronze Age world was probably the most challenging part because that Bronze Age world has been so lost to us and what survives is in fragments and ruins and we see a lot of blank 
you know, white marble statues that actually once would have been vivid with colour and really bright and actually quite gaudy, probably. Um, and it's, it's not the way that we necessarily imagine the ancient world to be. Um, so that took, that took a lot of piecing together. And again, I'm sure that any author of historical fiction finds it when you start to write a paragraph about a character and you get stuck on the first sentence because you think, no, but what, what exactly are they sitting on? What exactly are they eating? What, what are they drinking out of? Um, and so one kind of tiny little scene can actually take hours of um, visiting the British Museum website, reading textbooks, trying to, um, trying to assemble this world into something that we can feel like we are transported to. And and do you, do you feel now that you're sort of you know three three books and three books in in this world that you're uh, you're, you're fully immersed in it? Are you living half in 2023 and half in? in <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. I flip between the two. But for this one, I had to learn all about um, shipbuilding and sailing. So there's always something new. <laughs> and. Um, so you started the New Year's resolution and the, um, your, your studies and so on. What, what, what led on to the, um, uh, what was the journey between there and um, uh, an acceptance for a publisher? Um, so I, I always find that this story can really annoy people, so I apologise in advance if it does, um, because people do ask me, and especially, especially teachers, I quite often get teachers at my events say, but how do you stop teaching and start doing something else, which is a, a, an indication of, of, you know, not to get too political, but what this government have done to the profession of teaching. Um, but I, it was a New Year's resolution. I was really motivated and I wrote it very, very quickly um, because I felt this just this need to kind of keep going to the end. And it was my goal was to finish a first draft. Um, and that was the only goal that I had. But when it came to springtime, when it was about May, I, I saw that um, there was a charity auction, which you often see in, in publishing in kind of the book world, where um, people will auction, maybe sign copies of books, maybe half an hour's mentorship from an author, maybe an editor will offer to read the first 50 pages. And one of the, one of the prizes that was being offered was for an agent that I really had my eye on to read the first 50 pages of your manuscript. So I entered, I sent out off my first 50 pages to her. I didn't have a completed manuscript at all, I was halfway through, and she asked for the full thing. So I wrote the other half extremely quickly, <laughs> um, and although it was very raw and very unpolished, um, she could see that there was potential in there. And so, um, so I had representation um, by August, and in fact, we managed to complete the novel very quickly. And um, I had a publishing deal in November. And I think in publishing, things either seem to go at warp speed or take years and years. There doesn't seem to be a happy medium and in between. And I was very fortunate that this, this went very quickly. Um, are we meant to think the gods were on your side then? That's right. <laughs> um, and um, it, it's, uh, you've done so brilliantly um, with, with, the, with the books. Um, are there any particular moments that stand out for you in terms of publishing, coming and talking to people about these stories? I mean, it's so much has stood out. That it's, it's, it's such a strange thing because you write a book and you are so alone in that world and then you kind of emerge blinking um, into, into the rest of society. And it's incredible that people want to join you in that world, I think. So to, to meet readers and to have people say that they love these myths and they like my reinterpretation of them, or equally people who say, I didn't think I was interested in Greek mythology and now it sparked a whole love of it and I, I've gone to learn so much more about it. I just think it's, it's such an incredible and magical thing. And it, and it certainly does seem to be very popular at the moment. Um, have, you, have you read other sort of retellings of, of, of stories of that period or books set in that period? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm always so excited when there is uh, another a Greek myth retelling because I approach it definitely first as a reader and secondly as a writer. And um, I love to see how the same events and the same characters can be made so completely differently by viewing them from a different perspective. Um, how you can suddenly see somebody who you maybe thought you had preconceptions and an opinion of completely reshaped by the way that an author gives voice to them. And um, so, so 
says you think that this this uh, the, the you know what is it about the Greek myths that means that that you know three thousand years after these stories were first told we're still enjoying them. I think because there is so much to them. I think because they really stand up to scrutiny to being unfolded and unravelled. Um, that we so often come to them as children when we are interested in the stories of the battles and the heroes um, and the excitement of the slaying monsters and so on. And then as we get older and we start to look at, um, for example, looking at these stories from the female perspective, that we can see there is there's so much more to them that can be unpeeled. There is so much darkness in them, um, but at the same time, a real kind of hope. And uh, I, I think that really comes from the sense of thinking, um, like I said at the start, that they are so very much human stories. Um, and they can be a way, I think, because it's fantastical, it can be a way to explore these huge emotions that we have. And if you think of um, ancient Greek, uh, ancient Athenians going to the theatre in pursuit of catharsis, that feeling of that purging of those emotions of grief and sadness and rage and anger and all these things that you carry within you, that you can, you can purge through drama, you can purge through storytelling. I think that we still have that desire to do that. Um, I just, uh, glancing at the floor to see how I do with the time, um, uh, we already, should we move on to questions? Um, well, I, I do have one more before I open up the, the, the floor for those. So if there's any, anything um, you would like to ask Jenny, then now is the time to start thinking about it. Um, and again, it's talking about that, um, uh, the, 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 the sort of vividness of, of your, your settings in which you place these characters. Um, you mentioned going, there, going to Cyprus as a child. Do you, do you still go back? I mean, obviously, you might enjoy pandemic, so... Yeah, well, that was, that was um, when it came to writing a lecture, um, I wrote that during 2020 when we were in lockdowns. So it's, it's a story of women who are trapped by war. It's the story of um, Cassandra in Troy, um, who is, is in a lockdown, who cannot leave her city, who is under siege. And then Clytemnestra and Electra, who are at home in Mycenae, similarly unable to kind of move on until Agamemnon comes home, until they can start the rest of their lives. And so I think that kind of sense of claustrophobia and intensity really infused that novel. Um, but it did mean that, no, I couldn't travel, I couldn't go to Mycenae, I couldn't see the lion's gate that, um, that I describe in there for myself, um, which was a shame. Um, but I, so many of us were in that, that, we were all in that situation together. Um, so... I, I would always say to people that you know, there are lots of reasons where it is not practical or possible to travel abroad, and it's not the only way. You don't have to actually be there in order to be inspired enough to write it. You can immerse yourself in that world in so many different ways. But at the same time, I am always telling my publishers that, yes, I do need a research trip, and next time it will be vital. Um, so what are you thinking of, of your, your next research um, trip, your next book? Do you have a, uh, a plan in place? I do. Um, so I am st writing, I'm staying in the world of Greek mythology and I will still be writing from the female perspective. Um, a very controversial female figure who is not Medea, I have to say that every time because people always think, oh, controversial, it must be Medea, it's not. Um, I won't say more than that, but I think it's somebody whose story um, people will be really interested to hear, I hope. Well, I hope everybody um, spends some time enjoying the fantastic story of Atalanta first, which you she really is such an inspiring, um, inspiring character. And um, yeah, it's a, a cracking adventure story as well. Um, so with that, um, can I open up the floor for questions? Who has a question on the floor or we'll approach you with a microphone? Uh, hi, uh, so I'm a teacher, oddly enough. Uh, I was wondering, how would you help to inspire young people to be interested in the Greek myths and in that kind of period? Because I do teach teenage boys and they can be a little bit reluctant to engage, let's say that. But I have a massive passion for Greek literature, I always have done, my name's Rhea, so kind of I was born into it. <laughs> but I would love to try and encourage that within a new generation. I bet there's a lot of young faces here as well, and that's only really happy to see that that's still going on. But I'd love to see if there's a way that we can maybe engage 
more as well going forward. Yeah, I mean, I always found that it was when, when I got into the Greek myths that there would, there would be kind of a, a baked-in interest quite a lot of the time, especially among boys. I quite often found that was a good way in because then you find classical references in so much more literature going on um, that it's always great to be able to draw it back to that. Um, but I think that there is a real um, kind of surge of young people's interest in Greek, Greek mythology now where it may have been viewed before as being kind of very elitist, very kind of only taught in private schools and, and something for kind of older people um, in this very kind of like refined and verified environment. I, I'm really seeing now that there is, it, it seems to be so much more accessible and that there are um, more YA retellings coming through. Though actually a lot of them are still very much from the, from the female perspective, which is great to see um, for girls coming up that they can see that they themselves are represented in these hugely important stories that have kind of shaped the rest of our literature. Um, but um, I think that they can be kind of a more exciting way in sometimes if students are interested in those already or have come across them. Um, my kids really enjoyed things like Percy Jackson. That was really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of Greek mythology just kind of out there in popular culture in a way that it wasn't before. Um, so I think that there's lots of ways that young people are coming across it um, out there, which hopefully, if you can kind of find those connections in the classroom, that, that they can feel this is my story as well and it's it's not that it's not kind of something that I would I, I can only have access to if I'm at university or something but actually these stories belong to all of us and I think that if there's an increasing sense of that ownership that will really help help students to get involved and they have such opinions I found when I was doing the Odyssey with year nine um, that they really made me question Odysseus's actions in a way that I hadn't done before because they were like, hang on, his wife is at home being very loyal and patient and he spent seven years with that goddess. Um, and it kind of encouraging that sort of questioning, I, I thought, um, really, really helped as well. Thank you. Hi. I'm 16 and year 11. I wanted to know about when you were writing about these women, how much of your own like, imagination did you take when writing about them? Because obviously there's not much written about them in like the classics, like by Homer and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered how much was your actual research and how much like precedence you took for yourself? Yeah, well it's the great thing I think about writing from the female perspective in that what we have from their lives, and when it comes to Atalanta in particular, is these kind of series of just fragments of myth and kind of all, like sort of one story of her life and then another story of her life and no explanation of how they might connect or even what order in her life these things happen. And I think that's, that makes it so rewarding to tell the story, to kind of take these pieces as though they're sort of jigsaw puzzle pieces and then to create the rest of that image, myself, the rest of that picture, that scene myself. Um, and there's definitely huge gaps to fill in with imagination. Um, and sometimes as well, when it comes to mythology, even when you have a more complete story of somebody's life, you might have the events and the actions, but not so much insight necessarily into the motivations and what leads them to behave as they do. And so that can be a really good place to start, to kind of to take a character like Atalanta and say, here are kind of five things that I know happen to her that are in these myths. And now I'm going to work out why did she do all of those things? What could have led her to make those decisions? What could her motivation be? And all of that is, the, is, is where your creativity as a writer comes in. So although we talk about these being retellings, I think very much it might be more accurate to say a reimagining or a reinterpretation because there is so much by necessity that you have to add in to make it a complete, a complete character, a complete fully dimensional person. Um, and I also think it's very helpful, sometimes with female characters in particular, we see them only in terms of their relationship with the men in their lives. So we see 
Ariadne in relation to Theseus, but I'd never seen her really um, explored as a sister to Phaedra, for example, who's another really important mythological woman. And so thinking about, well, what are they like as sisters? What are they like as not just somebody's love interest, but actually as a friend, a sister, a daughter, a mother, all of these other roles that they play in their life as well. You mentioned about like um, fragments. Yeah. Does that mean if another writer had like decided to do a retelling, the events in Atalanta's life would have been retold in a different order, or was it like clear cut? Um, it's never clear cut. There is no such thing as a coherent chronology when it comes to Greek myth. You never know how old anybody is, um, and no. You, and in fact, when it comes to Atalanta. Um, it's very possible that she was two different women originally, that because we've got two sets of parents suggested for her, and it might be that there was a Boeotian Atalanta and, an, and a Peloponnesian Atalanta, and one of them was an incredible runner, and the other one was really good at hunting. And at time, they've become the, uh, over time, they've become the same, the same woman. They've kind of merged into one. Um, so there is absolutely no definitive version and I think it's so important if you want to tell Greek mythology that you get that that you, you banish that idea that I have to adhere to a particular order or I have to stick to the facts because myths have been retold so many times that there is no original version there is no kind of factual version of the myth so you really have a lot of freedom to um, to shape it into a story thank you any other questions? Hiya. Um, apart from Greek myths, I've, I've, I've been ever mythologies you, you, you like to you like as well, um, like Chinese or Norse or Celtic. And if so, I don't know if the character you want to write about it, if that's the case. Um, so, yeah, so I think um, there's a whole whole world of mythology out there. I wouldn't say that I would necessarily um, feel able to tell other mythologies myself. Um, and then my son's always asking me to learn more about Norse mythology because that's what he's really interested in. Um, but I have read some really great um, novels that, are, that tell different mythologies. So there is one called Dazzling, which is a story um, of, like, of, of a Nigerian myth about... Um, people who can transform into leopards. That was a really good one. Um, and it's, it's always men who transform into the leopards, but there is a girl born who has the power to do it. Um, there's Kakei, which is by Vaishna Patel, which is, um, I think, a, a, a Hindu retelling of the Ramayana, um, which is from the perspective of a woman who's always been quite villainized in, in, the, in other retellings, and so she's retold it, and that's really fantastic as well. Um, so I'm always interested to read um, all different kinds of mythology and so interested in the ways in which different mythologies intersect in so many ways and you have kind of events or characters or recurring themes that show up in, in all different kinds of mythology. I think it's absolutely fascinating um, to see, kind of, to kind of imagine where the origin point of, of all of it comes from. Um, so yes, so the answer is yes, I'm very interested. I don't have any plans to write outside of Greek mythology in terms of retelling myths at the moment. Uh, any more questions? Hi. Hi. Um, also, better classes here from me, actually. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, so I wanted to ask when it is uh, the research process of whichever um, retelling you're currently doing? Do you have any sort of favourite um, classical uh, authors that you go to, any ones that you stay away from? Um, <laughs> some of them are horrible to read, I think. <laughs> so do you have any that you kind of have gravity towards? Um, so I always, always come back to Ovid um, whenever, whenever I'm researching anything, um, because I just, I just, I, he's extremely problematic as a person. Um, but the Metamorphoses is such a rich resource because there are simply so many stories in it, and actually a lot of Atalanta stories because they are quite sparse. I took quite a lot from Ovid for Atalanta. Um, and of course, Ovid's Heroides, in which we have the women writing letters to men, um, 
I always find absolutely fascinating because people talk about these female-led retellings as being kind of a modern phenomenon. While Ovid was doing this in the first century, he was writing in the voices of female mythical heroines. And I certainly used his letter from Ariadne, which is so full of anger and, and you know, righteous passion to create my Ariadne. Um, but actually for this one, for Atalanta, um, Ovid wrote a letter from Hypsipyle, who's the Queen of Lemnos, which is the first stop on the Argonauts' voyage. And um, I didn't like what he did with Hypsipyle at all. He portrays her as being lovesick for Jason, um, which was inexplicable to me because Jason is, is so devoid of personality um, <laughs> and so ineffectual in so many ways. And Hypsipyle is this incredibly powerful queen of an all-female island. And Jason never thinks to question what happened to all the men, which is his first mistake. Um, so for that one, I, although I used Ovid, um, I used Ovid so much, I, I had to take quite a departure from him for that. Thanks. Um, any more questions? I admit I have one. Um, Thank you. I'm very jealous of your covers. <laughs> absolutely works hard. Um, So, I mean, I can't take any credit for the covers whatsoever. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate that I have had the same cover designer for all three of my novels and, and for the next one as well. Um, she's called Michaela Alcano. Um, and she won an award um, at the British Book Awards for Best Cover Designer, and I think we can see why. Um, but I think something that really took me by surprise that I would never have imagined before is that she reads the books before she designs the cover. Um, and I thought, you know, she would just simply get a brief and that would be all there is to it. But she, she puts so much care and attention to detail. And so all of the covers, they link together really beautifully. They reference things that happen in the book so subtly and so well. Um, and I think it's just been, I cannot understate, I can't overstate, sorry, the importance of these incredible covers. They just look amazing in bookshops. Um, can I ask actually, I mean, obviously we're in the library, but who here still sort of really prefers a physical book rather than a Kindle? Yeah, we are all friends. <laughs> um, I, I, I do think there is something quite special about sort of setting aside the time to sit down with a book and, and to have it. It looks so beautiful in the process. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It really is. I'm very much a physical book reader as well. Um, so when you were um, uh, writing um, Ariadne um, and following her journey, sort of following that thread too. Um, the, this was one of the great glories of this is always the sort of symbolism that, that, that runs throughout. How much were you sort of following the symbolisms of the ancients? How much were you finding your own sort of um, symbols and clues to, to lay through the whole story? I mean, there's always such a balance to be struck, I think, between approaching a novel as, um, you know, obviously somebody living in, in the modern world and kind of to what extent do you, how do you avoid imposing, I think, your values onto ancient people? How do you make their lives different? Um, and because, because people talk about my books as being feminist retellings, because I'm writing them as a feminist and they put women in the centre, um, but I don't want to impose my ideas of feminism onto these characters who, who have no access to those. I want to make them feel like they are convincingly believable Bronze Age people. And I found with Atalanta that she was not somebody like me and she didn't share the same ideas as me. But because she'd grown up in the forest, because she'd grown up in nature, I felt that she would see the world through symbols of nature, that that's kind of how she would understand and interpret the world around her. And that the, that would be the, the, the thing that anchored her when she's thrown out of her normal surroundings onto this ship when she's never been to sea before, surrounded by men who she's never encountered before, um, where she would find things that she could recognise and understand. And it, it would, for her, she would think very much, I felt, in terms of the natural world. Um, so those are the kind of symbols that I would come back to and use for her. But like I said, I didn't want to make her a modern woman. I wanted to make her um, as well as, as kind of being rooted in, in, in that world. She's also part of the hero's world and the journey that she's going to go on is going to be the hero's journey. So she is going to be interested in those symbols of heroism, the golden fleece being one of them. And it was interesting to see kind of how she 
how she follows that arc of pursuing these things which, um, which represent the kind of pinnacle of glory, the thing that's going to bring you fame, and to at what point she might become questioning of that and kind of questioning of, of how much that truly is worth in life. Um, because who's deciding who the hero is? How much, how much credence do you want to give to their judgment? Um, sometimes, I think, as well. Well, um, um, any more questions from the floor? Huh? Any more? <laughs> you're, you're giving a three for one. <laughs> um, hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to know if you ever used like, the retellings of um, other authors, and like, how much did you use their source material, and how much you refer back to the ancients? Like, the older writers? So I like to read um, contemporary retellings for enjoyment and I think for research I stick to ancient texts and ancient sources um, because I, I just I think that that's, that's the thing that I want to reinterpret rather than reinterpreting somebody else's reinterpretation if you see what I mean. Um, but I think it's always fascinating to see how, um, how the same character can just become somebody totally different, even among ancient authors as well. Um, I, I'm just thinking back to when you were saying how um, uh, you, know, you, you started um, uh, with the New Year's resolution. Obviously, it takes a great deal of discipline to produce an entire um, novel, let alone three. Um, do you have a particular writing routine that you stick to rigidly? So I think that's something that re has really varied um, because when I wrote my first novel it was around teaching, when I wrote my second novel it was in lockdowns around homeschooling, um, which is another reason it was so very dark that novel, it was a very bad time. Um, and then with Atalanta actually it's the first novel that I've written where I've kind of felt like um, the world has kind of gone back to as much normal as it can be and I found myself on the other side of that as of now being an author is my job and that's the thing I've got to do. Um, and somehow, I think when I had less time to write, I was a lot better at it. Um, um, I've really had to create that kind of routine and habit um, because, um, because I, I have more time to write and so I have more time to procrastinate about writing. And um, so I kind of trick my brain into writing mode by having, because I used to just, I, I wrote a lot of Ariadne sitting outside my son's bedroom waiting for him to go to sleep. I wrote a lot of it in notebooks or on my phone, on the whole carpet. Now I have a whole study to write in um, and I've become such a diva that I have a different scented candle for each novel. And so I light that and then that kind of takes me into the world. So for Atalanta, it was actually like a fig scented candle. So I could be like out in the woods. Um, and I played sounds of the woods or when for the bits that are on the Argo, sounds of the sea. Um, and I do things like that to kind of create a bit of a ritual so I know, oh, now it's time to write. That's marvellous. Thank you so much. Um, uh, well, last couple of questions and then I shall, I shall let Je um, Jennifer through from the interrogation. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, that, that's coming to the end of our event. Um, but it's not the end of the festival. There are some tickets remaining for um, other events. So, you know, hopefully we'll um, see you again today or tomorrow. Um, and uh, please do complete one of the feedback forms. Um, it's really helpful for the team for the next Ghost Fest. And if you can pop up a comment on the post-it board, that would be much appreciated. Um, Jenny will be signing books in the library foyer before you head off to the bookshop. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to um, our lovely hosts at Milton Keynes Central, Central Library. Um, our festival bookseller, Waterstones, um, the ABT from Carg, and our fabulous volunteers. Thank you all very much, guys. You're looking after us very well. Um, our lovely sponsors at uh, Milton Keynes City Council. And last but by no means least, fantastic writer Jennifer Snape. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.